Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this miserable gray day. Um, we appreciate it. I'm Pat Thomas. I'm the director of the graduate program in health and medical journalism at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. And for 10 years, I've been co-sponsoring this lecture series with my friend Dan Colley. He's right down here in the front. And he's the director of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. Um, when we invited uh, Dr. Glenn Nowak to come speak here today, we didn't have really any idea that one of the top news stories for the last week or so would be a measles outbreak, uh, which has also reawakened a raging controversy about who makes decisions about childhood immunization, uh, parents or some sort of legal or school authorities. Now, 15 years ago, there were so few cases of measles in the United States that public health officials declared that it had been officially eliminated. But last year, 2014, there were 600 cases. And in the first two months of this year, since the Disneyland outbreak, there have been 121 cases in 27 states. So I think we can safely say measles not eliminated. Um, for 14 years, Dr. Glenn Nowak may, played a huge role in shaping what the nation's top public health agency, the Centers for Disease Control, told the public about the value of childhood immunizations, including the MMR uh, vaccine that uh, protects against measles. He taught here at UGA before he took on this big role at CDC. And fortunately, after he had, uh, he was tired, I guess, of running interference for uh, CDC executives, he came back to us where he now heads the Center for Health and Risk Communication. And I'm really delighted to be on the same faculty with him. He teaches journalism students, advertising and public relations students about health communication, risk communication, consumer behavior, and how people process information. So we're really thrilled to have him here uh, with us tonight uh, to talk about us uh, what communication can and can't do to help people make smart decisions. Thanks very much. Glenn? Well, thank you. And thank you for coming out tonight. Um, as a former Wisconsinite, I can, I can well um, tell you that I, I don't miss this weather. <laughs> uh, I, go, I go back in summer rather than in winter. As Pat mentioned, um, I was at the faculty at the University of Georgia for nine years. And then I went to work for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I spent about six and a half years as Director of Communications for the National Immunization Program. And then I spent about six and a half years as director of media relations for CDC as a whole. And so I thought what I'd do today is draw upon all those experiences, not specifically fo focus on vaccines, although I do a lot of vaccine work even today. Um, I, I try not to get myself stereotyped or pigeonholed too much in the vaccine box, although I do quite a bit in vaccines. But I thought it'd be more fun to kind of broaden it and, and we'll try to weave in measles and other things um, throughout. And we'll start with... So I thought I would draw up, just give you a sense of background. I worked on a wide range of health issues at the CDC, uh, from influenza, um, vaccine safety, tuberculosis. We had a gentleman who uh, took a plane from Atlanta, went overseas, came back, um, and he had extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. And so that made the news for a, a number of weeks as we dealt with that issue. We had concerns about um, vaccine-preventable disease outbreaks. Measles is the most recent, but before measles, there was concern about whooping cough and pertuss or pertussis outbreaks. There has been always concern about influenza and seasonal flu, and I've been there for the H1N1 pandemic, as well as for influenza vaccine shortages. So I'll, some of what I'll be talking about draws upon or draws from those experiences. Um, why do you need communicators at CDC? Well, one day this arrived in my, my email. It said that the media ought to know this. Well, it's pretty complex. I mean, the influenza branch at CDC has developed primers and probes that can be used in real time reverse transcription polymers, chain reaction assays with respiratory specimens and viral cultures to presumptively identify the presence of influenza A, H5, Asian lineage viruses. This will be the first FDA cleared test of this kind. It'll be sent to LNR laboratories. Stop the presses, send that out. <laughs> so my first reaction to this was, and this means what? I mean, what would this mean in English? And so that was my first phone call, was to the person who sent it to me, saying, could you kind of talk me through what this means in English? And we went back and forth, and it turns out that what this meant in English was this. 
Um, new test quickly spots bird flu in people. And that was, in fact, the headline of the press release. And then U.S. officials announced Friday the approval of a new rapid lab test to detect bird flu in humans. The test works by, de by detecting viral genetic material, which in turn is used to demonstrate the presence of the virus. It took about six or seven back and forths <laughs> to get there. One of the concerns at every turn was we're losing scientific precision. And the reality is we were. But if we were trying to get this to a broader audience and, and, and try to get their interest, that had to happen. And that sometimes is one of the challenges in doing health and risk communications. As Pat alluded to, um, there's been a lot of health issues in the news recently. These are just a smattering of the ones that, that I've noted in the last probably two months. We had Ebola. We had Ebola in the US. We had measles, um, the spread of measles in the US. We have had a flu season that has been pretty bad. Uh, we've also had a flu vaccine that has not been very effective against the strains that are circulating, which is a communications problem if you're at the CDC or, or you're an advocate of influenza vaccination. Recently, uh, there were reports that even if you watch your diet and exercise a lot, um, that might not be enough, that you're fighting genetics. <laughs> and so all the advice about diet and exercise for some people, um, even if they want to do it or do it, it may not be enough in terms of battling weight. And then a couple days ago, there was a story in the New York Times about we're not paying enough attention, we're not worrying enough about accidents or unintentional injuries. And they are like the third leading cause of death in the world. And so trying to get attention for things that hurt us. So my first key message is this one, is that it's important to do communications. We want to have good communications but it's often much, much harder than people envision, or much harder than they would like it to be. I often got called into meetings on a very contentious issue and was asked, so what's our message gonna be? As if we could just find the one message, send it out, and everybody would be okay. <laughs> rarely, rarely happens. For a lot of things, there are different audiences, there are different values, different beliefs, and they're all looking for different things. And so it's very rare that, that, that one message is gonna accomplish everything, but people who don't do communications often would like to believe that that's how it works. So I wanted to start by talking about some of the difficulties when it comes to doing communications. And I, I, I've always loved this picture. Um, I've never seen this highway. Uh, <laughs> although during construction season, it seems like you've near this highway. And the first challenge is one I've just alluded to. It's this one. You know, why do I have to communicate? You know, I've got a really good recommendation. It's based in sound science. It's really something you should do. Why don't you just do it? How does that play out in, in, in a world like the CDC? Well, it plays out with the expert comes up with, they've got their recommendation. And they often feel really confident about the recommendation because it's grounded in science and there's a consensus among others that it's a good recommendation. So it's not just their hand on the, on the recommendation, it's the hand of a lot of people. And they look out at a group like you and they say, we just gotta deliver this recommendation to that group. <laughs> and once they see it, hear it, read it, we will have healthy people. People will fall in line, we'll, we'll get what we want, we'll be much healthier as a community, much healthier as a state, much healthier as a nation. So their model is this one. And it's, it's a model you often see. Um, I often see people say that we need an awareness campaign. And an awareness campaign is another word for saying an information campaign. I need to do something to get some information out there about a health topic or an issue and if I get that health information out there or that information out there, a couple of things are gonna happen or so they, so they think. You're gonna become more aware, you're gonna become more knowledgeable about the health issue. That knowledge in turn is gonna change your attitudes and beliefs about the health issue. And then you're gonna either change your behavior to stop doing the unhealthy thing or you're gonna adopt the new recommended healthy behavior. 
That's the model that many people who don't do communications often have when it comes to communications. Unfortunately, this rarely happens. It's rarely that simple that I give you information, you read the information, and you go, oh, boy, I didn't know. <laughs> I, now I'm going to change my life. I didn't know smoking caused cancer. <laughs> Thank you. I'm now going to quit smoking. Sometimes that works, but, 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 but very rarely. A second communication challenge I often found when I was at CDC or working with scientists and doctors was how they viewed people like me, how they viewed communicators. Their model was, um, whether it's a scientist or a policymaker or the head of a program, they would say, I need communications. I need to bring in communications expertise. And so they would bring in the communication expert. And they would look at us as having expertise, some kind of a method, and there's lots of methods, and typically you've got these kinds of things where the communication person comes in, does some research, uses the research to figure out what are some possible messages, how can we position this, we might test it, we figure out what channels or what media to use to put our messages in, we figure out who the spokespeople should be, and then knowledge change, attitude change, and behavior change happen. That's what they envision. So they often think of one of the big things we bring to the table is compelling messages. And if you're a communications person, one of the things you always have to be mindful of is one of the reasons you're in that room or you're working with those folks is because they do want better messages. They want strong messaging, and that's the role you need to be able to play, is to help them on that side. Now, again, one of the challenges they often think of, you'll come up with the one magic bullet message that will work with all people. Their view is that you'll then take those messages and you'll shout them <laughs> out to the target audience. You'll use social media because everybody's using social media, so you better have some social media in your campaign um, because they know social media is out there. They, they, they still believe in the traditional media, so they, they think they'll have stories about this in traditional media. Again, they, they see not a diverse audience, and so when a communication person looks at an audience, they often see the diversity and the wide range of, of possible views and demographics. Oftentimes, scientists and doctors and others who, do, um, who don't do communication on a regular basis, they see everybody as kind of the same. You're all targets, and I just gotta hit the target and you'll change your behavior. So, much different worldview. But they see uh, the communications person as leading to success. And when that success happens, not only will I have changed your behavior, but it'll be a story in the media as well. <laughs> the media will be like, wow, look how great that government program was. <laughs> Let's do a story on the people behind it. Even though that rarely happens, scientists and doctors like to think that that does happen quite a bit. And then uh, Brian Williams, um, you hope that the guy in the media is actually telling the right story, the true story. He's not embellishing the story. So that's another assumption we make as viewers. And then comes the applause. You, you did your job and you're ready for the next health issue um, and your next success story. So that's how scientists, doctors, epidemiologists often view the, the world of communications. It's, it's quite simplistic. Um, a lot of assumptions about how easy things are. Messaging and messages. People do realize that a compelling message, a relevant message, a message that speaks to you has a high probability of impacting you or a higher probability of a message that doesn't have those characteristics. One of the challenges in the world of health and public health is that everybody wants to rush out and do some communications and often forgets one of the critical first steps is this, is thinking about, you know, what is it are we trying to accomplish? They don't want to rush to, let's do a PSA campaign, or let's start doing posters, or let's go to social media, let's, let's try to go viral. But you have to step back and figure out what is it you're trying to accomplish. And when you have that conversation, a lot of times what you find out is that they're thinking really broad. They're thinking that they want to achieve some very big outcomes. 
they want to reduce the number of deaths from this disease, condition, or illness. They want to reduce health care costs. They want people to live longer, better lives, fewer people with health-related disabilities. They want to accomplish a lot of really big things. And that's all fine and well, but you're talking about a single campaign, or in some instances, little more than a press release. And it'd be great if a press release could accomplish those things, but it's highly, highly unlikely. And so then you have to talk a little bit further and say, well, let's talk more about what could this campaign do in terms of trying to move us toward those kinds of outcomes. And that gets you these kinds of things, where you can say, is the point of this campaign to have greater knowledge among a group of people about this health issue? And if so, why is it important they have that knowledge? What are they supposed to do with it? Is it greater adoption of a program? Is it positive publicity? Is it more money or resources for our program? Is it continued adoption of a behavior? What exactly is it that you want to achieve with your campaign? Now, what do you think the, the number one answer is? Any, anybody care to venture a guess? How many would say number one, the first bullet? Greater knowledge or awareness? Okay. How about the second one? Greater adoption, use of a program, a service. Okay, a couple. Positive publicity, positive media, buzz. <laughs> yeah, quite popular. <laughs> More money, resources, funding for our program. Yep. And then continued adoption or use of the program. It's a trick question, because what you get back is all of the above. <laughs> So when you have these conversations, people say, I want my campaign to do all of those things. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. And again, it may or may not be feasible. It may be one or two of those things. Oftentimes, you're talking about the third one, which is generating buzz or positive publicity. Another challenge, this was, I don't know if people know, but John Oliver, the British comedian, he's got a show on HBO, and, and I, I tend to watch it when it gets posted on, on um, the internet. He had one a couple weeks ago on pharmaceutical marketing. A really good look at pharmaceutical marketing. And, 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 but there was a couple things in there that I, th I think he highlighted that are worth keeping in mind if you're in public health and you're trying to impact a public health issue. This segment had to do with, with pharmaceutical marketing. One of the things he pointed out in this segment was people in America take a lot of prescription pills. 70% take one pill, have one prescription, 50% um, have two, and there are 40, 4 billion prescriptions a year. <laughs> a staggering amount of money. So pills are very popular in America. Now why does that matter if you're a health communications person? What is it about a pill? Well, pills are relatively simple to take, <laughs> right? They're easy. Um, and we'll assume that they don't have any you know, side effects. So, so people love the convenience and ease of a pill. We spend in this country $329 billion on prescription medicines. So we clearly look to things like pills and medical interventions. And that's a challenge in public health because public health typically is not marketing or promoting or advertising medical interventions. They're, you know, they're, they're offering, they want you to eat healthy, exercise, watch your weight, get a preventive screening test, those sorts of things. And so you're competing with this in public health. That is a difficulty. The other difficulty he pointed out is that not only do people favor pills, and not only is there a lot of marketing of these pills, but $4 billion a year is spent on marketing pills to consumers and about $24 billion is spent on marketing pills to doctors. Now, a couple things relative to difficulties for public health. One is that it's real hard. Doctors don't have much time in the, per, in the course of a visit. They have 10, 15 minutes maximum. They often have a lot of things they want to talk about or people are recommending they talk about. So you're now competing with someone who can buy some of the doctor's time. That is a challenge. Because doctors are often looked upon as the source for most people as to what to do 
um, about a health issue, including vaccines. There's a lot of research in the vaccine world that for 80, 85 percent of parents, the final determinant of whether they get vaccinated is that conversation with their doctor. And so their doctor has to be willing, able, and equipped to have that conversation. And again, if there are other things that are pressing for their time, um, that can be a challenge. So second part of my talk, realities. <laughs> what are some of the realities that we have to worry about and deal with? Well, I, I love this cartoon. <laughs> so I, I think it is so true. Uh, we all imagine that success is this linear straight line um, and it's easy to achieve. And if, and if we're not achieving it that simply, something must be wrong with us. The reality is success is more like the other line where you start out straight and then all of a sudden you hit a whole bunch of potholes and other things, obstacles, hurdles. And through persistence, perseverance, um, learning, making changes, you get success. And so I, I think that's the same in the world of health communications and public health communications. It's often not linear. So one of the realities is science and medicine. They're constantly evolving, constantly changing. And that can be a huge source of confusion for the public, for reporters, for policymakers, because we, again, we would like to think, as much as scientists are always reminding us, that science is about uncertainty, science is about trying to disprove what you already think you know. Um, despite saying that, most lay people, most reporters look at science and expect it to be fairly consistent um, and not so much changing. Good example of this, I don't know if people saw this uh, recently, um, for years telling people watch your cholesterol, watch your diet, take steps to lower your cholesterol through diet, avoid certain foods. And now an advisory committee has come out and said, well, you know what, not so much. Now, what was interesting about this story, and I think this story has a, a number of good examples, and so you know, one of the things that's been highlighted is eggs. Eggs were abandoned in this early on, and now they seem to be exonerated. But what struck me as I read this story was a couple of quotes. The first, the committee is not reversing the advice about the risks of having high LDL cholesterol, that that's still a bad thing. Now, that's a really tough communications challenge because people are being looking at the, hey, I don't have to worry about my cholesterol. <laughs> I can eat whatever I want. And they're not actually saying you don't need to be worried. <laughs> what they're saying is that the diet doesn't have as big of an impact and the foods you eat aren't as significant as we thought they were. This is still a health issue. But if you looked at many of the headlines, that sort of got lost. Another point is it said that we're making this change because there wasn't definitive evidence to tell the average person to reduce how much cholesterol they consume. And so there wasn't enough specific information. So we were giving you this advice, but we actually didn't have a really good basis for giving you the advice. Now, as bad as that sounds, it gets worse. <laughs> This person says, it's the right decision. We got the dietary guidelines wrong. They've been wrong for decades. Now, if you're looking for trust in health authorities, public health officials, medical authorities, this is going to reduce your trust. Because if they've known for decades, it begs the question, so why didn't they tell us sooner? And that has, these kinds of stories do have an impact on other health issues and other, issue, other recommendations, including vaccines and immunization. Because those people will remember these things and say, I know you tell us that the vaccine is safe, but you told us, you told us our diet um, affected our cholesterol level, which affected our health, and you were wrong for decades, and you admitted it. So that's a problem. He noted only 20% of a person's blood cholesterol. The levels measured with standard tests come from diet. The rest comes from genes, a pretty sobering uh, number. We told people not to eat eggs. It was never based on good science. And um, you should still avoid <laughs> fatty foods. And so, again, kind of an odd thing. Again, you're, you're trying to get out a couple of different messages. Um, the diet stuff doesn't matter in terms of bad cholesterol, but the diet stuff does matter in terms of other things, like diabetes. Now, that's going to cause some people, I'm sure, to say, well, how can you be so certain 
it's linked to diabetes. <laughs> CDC had some issues earlier this year. Um, the vaccine, the flu vaccine effectiveness, 23%. Again, that, that has challenges going forward because next year trying to persuade people to get an influenza vaccine, often what you'll find that they remember is this. They don't remember that people who got the vaccine, some of them did benefit. What they remember is 23% effectiveness. There are news media realities that you have to, you have to deal with. Um, the news media are constantly looking for stories. Health issues like measles become, come in the news, and they can be in the news for six, seven, eight, nine weeks. And they can dominate the news, and they can make it hard for other health issues to get news media attention. The news media do favor certain things. They favor conflict, controversy, and differences. They favor having a human interest angle. They favor looking at stories that involve change. They like to have a local angle, and that's important. And so that does play a role in, in figuring out how to communicate about health and science. Another reality is we all need to be mindful of our assumptions. Um, what are some of the assumptions? One of the biggest assumptions that, 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 that people run into is this one. If we offer it, they will come. And it's often based on this notion that the commercial marketers are so smart. <laughs> and look at their success. And how come we in public health can't get the same kind of success? I mean, they do it all the time, and they're always successful. And so I would always point out, well, not always. You, still, you can't buy Cheetos lip balm anymore. Now, if you think about it, I mean, it doesn't seem like a good idea. But they must have had some basis for thinking it was a good idea because it required marketing capacity, a production plant, packaging, um, those kinds of things. Wild potato chips, which were going to help us lose weight because they were coated with an oil that made them indigestible. Um, it turned out that oil caused other health problems, digestive problems, so they didn't last. And then um, Colgate, a really smart marketer, very successful in toothpaste. They actually tried frozen dinners. Yeah, why not? I mean, we make toothpaste. And so the point is, is that it's not just if we offer it, they will come. And you see the same thing in the world of public health. People gravitating toward apps. If we only had an app, or let's build an app. The last estimate I saw, there was like 80,000 health-related apps. And so you have to market apps, and then you have to get people to use apps. H1N1 vaccine. We thought at CDC there would be overwhelming demand for this vaccine. And there probably would have, but the vaccine didn't arrive when it was primarily needed. It arrived after it was primarily needed. And not surprisingly, as a result, there wasn't as much demand. There was a lot of excitement, and there still is a lot of ex excitement about HPV vaccine. Because this vaccine can prevent certain types of cancer, including cervical cancer. But the assumption was that this would kind of sell itself. Um, and that hasn't been the case. I was at a meeting last week, and one of the doctors there pointed out that there's a new HPV vaccine that's about to be recommended. It, it, it basically adds five more strains of protection. And again, he had the same, he, the same belief, was that this is going to sell. It's got five more strains. Um, it'll sell, but it won't sell itself. It's going it, it, to take some effort. And again, many products do fail. People believe, if I just come up with that one right message, and I mentioned that before, a um, good example is eat healthy, your life will be better. That's a true message, perhaps. Um, but what happens when you give that to a target audience? You get things like, what does that mean? Define eat healthy. I already do. How will my life be better? <laughs> You've made a promise. Tell me specifically, if I eat more broccoli, what else in my life is going to change? How will it be better? And then you got others who simply say, thanks, but no. I prefer to eat what I like. And so you have to keep in mind that. Expectations. Another thing that can get you in trouble. Um, <laughs> anything unusual about that photograph? <laughs> Have you ever gotten a flu shot with a needle that big? <laughs> If they do bring one out that big, you probably want to run. <laughs> now, why is it that the case? Well, that's the expectation of the 
people in this medium about flu shots, that they must be big <laughs> and they must be painful. You often see vaccine stories and you have the person looking like they're in pain. And so that doesn't help when it comes to vaccines. You gotta be mindful of your expectation that just because you think it's important as an expert that a broader public audience will think it's important. My favorite example here is this. Um, the American Academy of Entodontists decided about five, six years ago that one of the issues facing the, the US was a lot of us use the term root canal in a negative way. And in their world, a root canal is actually a good thing. And so they didn't like a good thing being characterized negatively. So they decided we need a campaign to change the public perceptions of root canals. Because good root canals save the tooth and therefore it's a good thing. And so their campaign, I'd rather have a root canal. <laughs> then stop eating ice cream, lose a tooth, or live with pain. Now this campaign's been going on for five years. Has anybody seen it? No, probably not because the ads mostly appear in publications targeting dentists, which is kind of a weird place to put them. But I, I think it's because it's donated media time or media space. And it turns out that every year they dedicate a week to National Root Canal Awareness Week. And so this year, that turns out to be March 22nd to March 28th. And so if you're looking for something to do that week, uh, get a root canal. <laughs> Another thing that, that scientists and doctors and those who don't do communications often fall into the trap of is if I just give you some numbers, that will compel you to change your behavior or to care more. So, these are the actual numbers. This is the actual copy from an ad, um, public service ad, that was undertaken a couple of years ago. Strikes 2 million Americans a year. Complications kill 200,000 people. More than breast cancer, car crashes, AIDS combined. And the good news is it can be prevented. And so when I ask people, what is this that does this kind of damage and can be prevented? Many people will say, well, it's got to be a heart attack, heart disease. Um, something in that ballpark. This was a campaign for deep vein thrombosis. And so again, just giving you the numbers is often not enough. But many people want to believe that I just have to give you some compelling data and you will change your opinions. When I was a media relations director at CDC, um, almost every single day people came to me with ideas for the media stories. Um, there's a service I subscribe to these days that I get to see many of the press releases that are being pushed out um, by many places. And this is what you can see in a typical day. So you've got three press releases talking about Alzheimer's and what could cause it. Iron, copper, or breastfeeding. Now the breastfeeding one sounds like, hmm, it's intriguing. So I actually looked at that study. The study's methodology was they interviewed, I think, 10 or 12 women who were in their 80s. And they asked them to think back about how long they were breastfed. <laughs> that was the study. I'm not making it up. That was a, little, a few problems with the methodology. <laughs> um, October 15th, Global Hand Washing Day. Now, if you were an editor or, or you worked in the media and, and these all came across your desk and you're doing health science and medicine, you may only be able to do a story on one of these. And so you have to decide based on your audience and its interest, which one you're gonna do a story on. Looking at this list, some of them probably fall pretty easily into the not a story. I mean, global hand washing day. People get excited about these days, but at CDC I would often tell them, that's great, but what is the story? Declaring October 15th Global Hand Washing Day is not a story. I mean, what is the story that you're gonna to try to pitch in concert with that? Teen smokers ignoring pack warnings. I mean, probably a really good study, but the reaction of many reporters and journalists and even members of the public would be, duh. I mean, teenagers ignore everything. The story would be they paid attention to something. 
and it wasn't a video game. That would be a story worth, worth doing. And I speak as the father of a 15-year-old. Uh, <laughs> driving stoned is safer than driving drunk. A recent headline. This did get play. Um, and again, the story, though, was basically saying a couple things. One is that unlike with alcohol, there's no test that can def define you know, when you're impaired from, from smoking marijuana. But secondly, we don't think you should smoke a lot of marijuana and then go drive. So, so what are some of the possibilities? What are some of the things I've learned um, in my time doing these things? How can you increase the likelihood of success? Um, three things I want to touch on. <clears throat> One is you need to think about where people lie on, on a continuum like this. Not everyone is in the same place when it comes to a health issue. And you can take vaccines, for instance. This, this works really well for vaccines, and I'm actually going to use vaccines as my example. But people fall on a continuum from being completely unaware of the issue to consistently doing what it is that you want them to do. You can take that continuum, and you can divide it in half. And on one side of that line, are the people who I would call the non-doers. They don't do what you want them to do with respect to the health topic or issue. The other people are doers. And so one of the things that we would do at CDC is try to assess what's different about the doers and the non-doers when it comes to this health issue and our recommendation. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you need to recognize that when it comes to communications or behavior change, not all of these groups are alike. In fact, there are vast differences in terms of how easy or, all, or how hard it is to impact some of these groups. And so, for instance, if you want to have a high probability of communication success, focus on the people who are unaware or the people who sometimes do and try to get them to do it more often. In the world of vaccines and immunization, one of the things that's been done recently is the CDC and others want adults to get vaccinated according to the adult schedule. The current research shows that 85% of adults don't even know that there is an adult immunization schedule. So you could focus on that top deck group. Then there are two groups that are really hard <laughs> to impact. The disinterested, because they're disinterested. They are not interested. They could care less. And you have to somehow make them want to care. The other group is the people who have actively declined or refused. In the world of vaccines, there are a small percentage of parents who decline almost all or all vaccines. They are adamant refusers. Oftentimes, they have a completely different set of medical beliefs and science beliefs. They may not believe that, that, that bacteria and viruses exist. And so again, you've got a difficult communications challenge because they don't believe it. Other people, it's, 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 a, it's a part of their value system. Um, and so you, you'd have to actually change how they view the world. Really, really hard to do. As I mentioned, the world of vaccines, we want this to be the case, that everybody says we love vaccines, we understand vaccines are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, that's unfortunately not the case. What the case looks like is this, strong vaccine acceptance, active vaccine refusal. And then, as I mentioned, some people just don't know that they should get certain vaccines. But you can actually go further, um, and you can segment it even more. Some people refuse all vaccines. Most people who refuse vaccines only refuse one or two. And you can look at that. And often the vaccines that they refuse are things like influenza vaccine. Some people are hesitant, but they get vaccinated. Some people are hesitant, but they delay. And so you can use that kind of a model in terms of your communications and your behavior change planning. Another one that I, that I really like uh, came from two doctors, a husband and wife team. And they actually said, when you look at us as medical consumers, we vary on three dimensions. Some of us want as much medical intervention as possible, maximalists. Some of us want as little as possible. We're minimalists. Some of us are believers in mainstream medicine and some of us are doubters in mainstream medicine. And then finally, some of us like lots of technology. We want the machines, the drugs, and all the other stuff. Others, not so much. They're more into natural healing. And so they said that that's how you need to look at the world of, of medical consumers. And, and in fact, I've done work where you can actually map this on vaccines. 
And so you can take that model and you've got this group of parents who are unquestioning acceptors. They often are real believers um, in mainstream medicine. They often favor technology and they like technology. There's the cautious acceptors. Um, they move a little bit, they, they believe in mainstream medicine, but maybe not so much the maximalist view, more moderate, more in the middle. You've got the hesitant at the intersection of all those things. You've got the later selective vaccinators, and then finally you've got the refusers. And that's a lot of how the research currently shows things lay out. Another thing that can help you succeed is viewing the world through the eye of your target population. Seems easy to do, but many organizations actually view the world through their lens. And they say, I want you to do this <laughs> because it's good for you. And so they've got some behavior. But what they fail to recognize is that you, as a member of a population or as an individual, have your own goals and your own priorities. And they may or may not map with those of the organization that's trying to change your behavior. And in fact, our default is typically the status quo. We're pretty happy with where we are. We don't want to change or be changed. So organizations know enough about communications to say, well, we need to do these things. We need to have some facts and data. We need to explain. We need to make it kind of easy for us. Now, that, that, that's what we need to do, our communications campaign. And they do that, and guess what? It doesn't work because it reinforces you to keep doing the status quo, um, which requires change, which doesn't require change, and they want change. So to be successful, what you have to do is flip the world. You need to bridge that gap, and you do that by looking at the world through the eyes of your target audience. What are stories that they will find compelling, meaningful, relevant? What are messages that they will find meaningful, relevant? What are benefits for them? Why should they do the behavior? What is going to resonate with them? What's in it for me? If you're targeting me and you want me to do some behavior, what is in it for me? It should be one of your primary considerations. And then you have to make it easy for me to do it. Because if it's going to be hard, or if there's barriers to me doing it, chances are I'm not going to do it. And so if you do that, you can bridge that gap and increase your likelihood of success. Now, the, the final thing that most scientists, doctors, organizations don't recognize when it comes to being successful in communications is this one, is in addition to those things I just described, you often need to do one more thing, and that is take a risk. If you aren't willing to take a risk in communications, chances are your messages, your campaign is going to be pretty blah, pretty vanilla. It's going to be wallpaper or landscape. You have to do something to stand out in an environment where there's a lot of other people trying to get attention. So what can that look like? One of the more successful campaigns CDC has done is this campaign here, Tips from a Former Smoker. Very graphic images about the harm caused by smoking. Makes a lot of people squeamish. They don't like to see these kinds of things makes you uncomfortable. That's pretty risky, pretty hard hitting. But it broke through the clutter, it got attention, got discussion, and more importantly, there's lots of evidence to show it's worked. It's increased calls to, hop, to, to, to quit lines, and there's data that shows that people are quitting smoking. The zombie apocalypse, a big risk. Their challenge was every September is National Emergency Preparedness Month. We need to get attention from the media. <laughs> Good luck. I mean, calling a reporter and saying, hey, guess what? It's September again. It's National Emergency Preparedness Month. Let's do a story. And let's, let's get something on the front page this time. Real hard. It's a dry topic. Well, they linked it with zombies because zombies are in. The other reason they linked it to zombies was they wanted to reach a younger audience rather than an older audience. This worked beyond their wildest imagination. Got lots and lots of attention. But again, not without controversy. Not everybody thinks CDC should have done this. And so that they probably could have gone further, but there were constraints because not everybody was comfortable with the risk, but it got them a lot of attention. 
One that caught my eye um, in December was the state of South Dakota. Don't jerk and drive. Taking a heck of a risk. Um, the campaign was targeting drivers, primarily during the winter months when the roads are snowy and icy, and people would oversteer or jerk the wheel. And that would cause the car to they'd lose control of the car. And so they had some PSA showing what happened. The car would tumble and get hit by another car and blow up. They did a press conference to announce we're launching our jerk and drive campaign. They showed the PSAs. They showed all the materials. They knew it had a double meaning. <laughs> and in fact, one of their primary target audiences was, was younger men, because they tend to be ones who oversteer. <laughs> so they also knew this would get buzz and go viral. <laughs> so that was all part of the plan. Well, the day after their press conference, they had to announce that they were withdrawing the campaign because some senior legislators thought that it was inappropriate for a state agency to do a campaign like that. And so it got nixed and it got pulled. But they took a risk. I mean, they, they knew they had to break through the clutter. And again, they probably had to take it to that point because if they'd brought the idea up earlier, it would have been stomped on um, and people wouldn't have let it go. They thought they probably had a chance that they could show you, here's what it would look like. Um, now, the, 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 the biggest one I've always liked is Dumb Ways to Die. I don't know if people have seen Dumb Ways to Die. Dumb Ways to Die is a really brilliant campaign. And it took a huge risk. And, I, and, I, and I, it was done by, the, by a metropolitan transit group in Australia. I don't know how they got it through the government approval process. Um, this would never have succeeded um, at many of the places I've worked um, for an, any number of reasons. But anyway, Dumb Ways to Die is a three minute long video and it features animated characters. And in the first two and a half minutes or so, they die in a lot of pretty silly ways. Some of them are possible ways, like sticking a fork into a toaster. Some of them are ways that you would never put yourself in, which is taking a helmet off in outer space and your, the head explodes. At about the two and a half minute mark, what happens is you, three, you see three scenarios involving trains. A person crossing through a train track when the crossing's down and getting hit by the train. You see a person jumping on the track and getting hit by a train. <laughs> you see a person chasing a balloon onto a track and getting hit by a train. And then um, the music ends and you see the, a, a statement says, be safe around trains. <laughs> now when I first saw it, I thought, there's no way this could be effective. It took you two and a half minutes to get to images about the train. <laughs> and then you didn't actually know it was for certain it was about a train until they put that tagline up. But it turns out this is actually a really brilliant campaign because in the first two and a half minutes, you're letting your guard down. You're watching this, you're enjoying the music, you're enjoying the animation, you're watching a, 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 a thing take its helmet off in outer space and blow up. It's got a really catchy chorus that involves dumb ways to die. And by the time the train thing rolls around, you now have realized that there are a lot of dumb ways to die. And then the train thing is put in a context where I can actually do something to avoid that. That is a w dumb way to die that I can actually avoid. I don't need to drive around the train crossing. I don't need to jump after something onto the track. I don't need to stand too close to the ledge. And so that is why I think it works. It lets people's guards down, people aren't defensive, and they're empowered. And it turns out that, that it won a number of awards, at the, at 28 awards at the Con Lions International Festival, um, 18 gold awards, 50 million views on YouTube, um, and that was as about a year ago. It's probably now way beyond that. People did, did um, spiffs and riff-offs of it called Dumber Ways to Die. And they let them use the music. Uh, the whole campaign cost a half million dollars for the animation and, and the song rights. And most importantly, at the end of the day, 21% reduction in accidents and deaths since the campaign began. And so a huge risk. Um, it was never meant to be anything but viral. And it went viral. And it got a huge audience. And if you ever have a chance to go, to go watch it, it's a really fun three minute long video um, and, and very powerful. So my final message, my second message is, 
that there are ways you can increase the likelihood of communication success. Know your assumptions. Watch your expectations. Look at the world through the lens of your target audience. Make things resonate, understandable, doable. Have a benefit or reward for doing it. Take a risk, and all those things will increase your likelihood of communication success. Now, you can also add vitamins. Uh, <laughs> And the vitamins would be resources, repetition, and partners, and partnerships. And if you do that, you even further increase the likelihood of communication. Yes, thank you for coming.